we've got uh, quite a few marketplace founders here and uh, I'll kind of let you take over the workshop. Um, but just everyone, um, just a quick kind of note, we're going to do a kind of Q&A after a presentation. Mm -hmm. So if you can just stay muted. Um, so that way Fabrice can uh, dive into things and then uh, just post any questions that you have um, in the chat and then we'll kind of call on you to uh, then come on and ask them directly. So. Okay. Um, so I guess I was asked to talk about like um, fundraising and everything around fundraising when it comes to marketplaces. And so before I go and delve deeper into what is it we that VCs look for when, when evaluating marketplaces, um, start by taking a step back and thinking through what do we look for in general when we're evaluating startups. And in a way, there are two types of risks that both VCs and entrepreneurs take. Um, there's the right one. There's execution risk and there's idea risk. So execution risk really means, do you as a founder, are you going to be able to fundraise and, and get the, 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 the funding that you need for your idea? Are you going to be able to convince your friends and family to give you the love money or the pools, friends and family at the money at the beginning, then the C, the pre-seed, the, the C, the A, the B, et cetera. Uh, or are you going to build uh, an effective team? Are you be able to build an MVP or build the product and refine it over time? And are you going to do the partnerships that are required to scale the business? And then there's idea risk. And idea risk is really three underlying components. Is do you have product market fit? Are you getting, so do people want your product? Two, can you sell that product at good unit economics? And then three, even if you have that, can you scale it? Do you have a scalable customer acquisition channel where the economics work? And, and you need both of those things. So before you approach a, a venture capitalist and before you want, you want to approach people for fundraising, you really actually want to try to de-risk it in their mind as much as possible. And that's why when people approach me, I don't want them to say, hey, I have an idea, I need money to go build it. That's actually not very compelling. But if they've actually convince their friends and family to give them money to build an MVP. And frankly, these days you can build an MVP of essentially anything for like 20K. Uh, and I have uh, an entire video or you, uh, on how you could do that. And and you've built your core team and you've even launched, even if you, you have no traction, that's already shown an ability to execute, an ability to build something that is compelling. So now... Uh, let's say you're, you've actually passed that stage, you've passed the MVP, and you're going out for your pre-seed round with uh, either pre-seed founds like a four or an angels, or you're going for your seed round. Um, what VCs look for in, in that, in, at that point of time is really four things. And different people weigh these four things differently. But I want to talk about, um, A, how VCs in general evaluate these things, how we evaluate these things. So, yeah. Um, one is the team. Do we like the team? Two is, do we like the business? Three is, do we like the deal terms? And four, does it fall in line with our investment thesis of where the world is and where the world is heading? Now, the thing is, this is a theory, but the practice makes a lot of... Let me put this into practice because every venture capitalist you ever meet will tell you, oh, I invest in extraordinary teams. Yeah, but what does that mean? What is an extraordinary team? It can't just be oh, I'll recognize it when I see it. It's not like, you know, porn. Uh, and, and there has to be a number of softer um, variables around it. And so for us at FJ Labs, what we mean by an extraordinary team is a team that has extraordinary storytelling skills because someone who can weave a compelling story is going to be able to raise money at a higher valuation. It's going to be easier for them to raise money. They're going to build a better team. They're going to get more PR. They're going to get a better business deals. But actually, that's not enough. It's a necessary but insufficient condition because if that's all you have, maybe you end up building Theranos, or maybe you end you end, you end up building uh, you end up building Fab.com. It goes large, but you don't have you don't have a profitable business. So the second key skill you need is you need to be metrics driven, analytical, really know the business you're in. But and if you do that, you you can build a very successful business. The thing is, if you only have that and you don't have the storytelling skills, maybe you build a lifestyle business and you don't have, you cannot scale your business. Now, in the process, in our case of a two one-hour meetings, we're reevaluating you. We're going to verify your passion, that's usually through your storytelling skills and your grit and tenacity through mostly challenging your assumptions. When you tell me how big you're, how much you're going to grow, what channel you're using, where your economics are, we're going to we're we're going to push you on those to understand where they are. Now, 
once we like the business, the, t- it, it, the team, in our case, it's not enough. We want to like the business. What does loving the business mean for us? So loving the business, frankly, first and foremost, above everything else, is does the business have act- as attractive unit economics? And I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, but there are a lot of variables you can use, right? Like, could it be a billion-dollar company? Can you be the market leader? Is it scalable and capital efficient? Uh, the thing is, all those things to me ultimately usually come down to does it is it a good does it have good unit economics because if so it, it, it ends up being a good business i mean there are a lot of things you look for in a marketplace right like is it is there fragmentation of supply and demand um and, the, on, and you want fragmentation on both sides how much can you charge etc but at the end of the day if you can build a skill a business where you have amazing in economics, you can usually in a market that's large enough, you can usually get there. And so it's really what we look for. So unit economics that we look for, I'll quickly go to the next page. So that's more definition of uh, yeah, definition of unit economics. So unit economics that we look for, um, and and this is a simplified take on it is. So the unit economics I mean, first of all, is in a marketplace would be you have your average order value. Someone is buying something. Then you, the marketplace, have a take rate. You take a you take a commission on that. And it ranges. It could be 1% to 50%. You know, often in marketplace is like 10 15 20%. Though it varies. Uh, and I can tell you how to uh, which one it should be based on the business you're in. But by evaluating the elasticity of demand and supply and charging the more elastic part of the demand. So after your take rate, uh, you remove all your variable costs, and that gives you your contribution margin. And that's what I care about. I want to know that your that contribution margin, how that compares to your customer acquisition costs. Now, if you're pre-launch, I want you to have thought through what it is. I want you to tell me, oh, we haven't launched yet, but we know that the industry, the average for this category is this. We know that our cost structure is this. We therefore think where net contribution per transaction is going to be this. And we also know that in the industry, on average, the number of transactions per month or per quarter or per year is this, and therefore we expect a lifetime over the a value of the customers over the first six months, twelve months, eighteen months to look like this. And then I want to compare that to your customer acquisition costs. Again, if you're pre-launch. I expect you to have done lending page analysis where you say, oh, well, we've seen the CPC is $1 um, and we've had 10% of those people that sign up. That's a t- that's $10 to a sign up. And we think that 10% of these will buy and that's a, that's a $100 CAC. And then you can compare that to to what you think the, the, the lifetime value of the customer is going to be. Not necessarily lifetime over the long run. What I want to see from a good unit economic perspective is that you recoup your customer acquisition costs in the first six months, that you 3x your customer acquisition costs on a contribution margin over the first 18 months. And ideally, you know, like none of you are going to have been live for 18 months. You don't know what the LTV is, but ideally you have negative churn and people buying more and more. And as a result, even though you've lost half the customers, the remaining half are buying so much more than the net. The LTV to CAC is 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1. Um, you know, quick example, just so we get a sense of how it works. You could have, uh, you're in a market where you're selling your, your products for $1,000. Your marketplace takes 10%, so you make 100 bucks per transaction. But then you have uh, a bunch of, of COGS, where right? you have to pay the payment fees. You have to you have the transaction fees that are involved with this. Maybe you need to manage the transaction. And so maybe you have 20% cost, so you make $80 a transaction. Uh, and if people are buying this product four times uh, over the first two years, you make six hundred forty dollars, and then you compare that a hundred dollar crack, and then you have a six four point four x to one CAC, to CAC, and that's a good business. So we expect you to have good unit economics. So if you have a good team, a good business, then we're like, okay, what are the terms at which you're raising? And you need to realize that in the world of venture, there's very clear set stages of what you raise from whom, when. And there's re- real expectations in the world of VCs of what, what they expect you to see. Now, um, in marketplaces, for instance, and again, I'm not looking for cheap price. I'm just looking for fair price. It has to be in line with the market relative to the size of the opportunity, the quality of the team, and the traction that you have. So if you come to me and you're like, I need to raise $20 million to launch, you know, that's not going to cut it because this is the way the market looks like. The, 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 the way the market looks like at, at pre-seed, you know, so if, again, you, you've gone to your fr- pools, friends, and family, you've raised the first 25, 50K, you've launched, et cetera. Now you go to angel. So the pre-seed, 
um, round. Actually, maybe I'll go to the general one. Um, the pre-seed round, you, you're at launch. You're raising 750K to 1 million at three to five free. And you're la launch, ra raising that typically for a lot of angels. Like they're putting 25K checks, 50K checks. There may be a few pre-seed funds. And with that, we expect you to get to your seed round. Now, your seed round, your marketplace, you're going to be doing like 150K a month in GMV, taking 50. Let, let's make the math easy. You're doing 150k a month in GMV. You're taking 20 percent, so you're doing 30k in net revenues. Um, and at that point, you can raise your seed round. You know, it's two to four at six to 12 pre. Granted, it's a pretty large range. The average is probably around raising three at nine pre in the 12 post, something like that. Um, and with that, so again, the pre seed is seed probably 12 to 18 month, um, where you're going from zero to 150k a month. C to A, 18 months. So the money you raise from the seed is to get you to the A. I expect you to get to maybe 650K a month in GMV. Uh, and that's for a marketplace with 50, 10 to 20% rate. Uh, if you're doing 50% or 1%, numbers would be different. You look more than net revenues. Um, there you raise from um, A, and B, a, a, a and B funds, sorry, the C funds, by the way, that you raise from are like FJ Labs, uh, Slow Ventures, Floodgate, First Round, Uncork. Then you have A and B funds where we play as well. Um, once you're at 650k about the GMV and you're raising whatever seven at 18 pre 25 posts, you know, something like that five to 10, 15 to 30. And with that, you the expectation is uh, you get your series B where you're doing let's say 2.5 million a month in GMV. Um, and there you're raising the 15 to 25 at whatever 40 to 80 pre from NEA, Sequoia, Climber, and Dries, I mean, all the usual. And then later than that, you go to the later stage funds. Um, and so most people, when they come to us, of course, they're at, at the pre seed Well, most of uh, most of our deals are the seed stage fund. So you're at 150K a month in GMV. You have reasonable QDE economics. And you found a scalable acquisition channel. And the reason you're raising money is because now you want to spend more money in that channel. And by the way, I don't care what that channel is. That channel could be um, – I'll put the uh, – and we'll show the slides afterwards. Um, this is a slide for marketplaces specifically. I don't care if that channel is Google, it's Facebook, it could be a sales team if you're B2B, it could be viral if for whatever reason you're viral, but I need, I expect you to have found a scalable acquisition channel. And by the way, even if you're pre-launch, I expect you to have uh, checked the density of the, the depth of your marketing channel. Like it needs to work, it, it ha needs to have enough volume if it's paid marketing that it would work if you're spending 500K a month in marketing, not just 50. And so you, I need to see the volume, the density of the keywords you're buying and the depth of the, of the traffic you're buying in Facebook to make sure that you can actually scale to 20, 30, 40 million revenues using that channel. Um, otherwise, it's not that compelling. Um, other thing to keep in mind is if your unit economics are not there, maybe it's not an issue as long as you have a path for getting them there. And so, for instance, let me let me let's say we're in a in a uh, we're in a food delivery business, and you're telling me, you know, we're doing 50k a month in in, in GMB, uh, but right now our delivery guy cost is 15 bucks an hour. He's doing one delivery per hour, and as a result, at that we have underwater economics, but. Once we get a 150K in GMV with enough density, um, then it'll be three deliveries an hour. It's be $5 an hour. The economics work. So as long as you tell me that with scale, you go into your metrics, I'm willing to buy it. Uh, but it cannot need all the stars in the multiverse to align. It has to come naturally from scale. And then last but not least, so these three are collectively required for us to invest. So you, the team needs to be great. The unit economics to be fantastic. The terms need to be fair. Um, now, at pre-seed, of course, the team is weighed more uh, than later. But once you reach seed, there's already a business, we're weighing all three reasonably, reasonably uh, collectively. And by the way, all three are required. If any of these three doesn't, if it's too expensive, we won't do it. If the unit economics are, under, are underwater with no clear path for better economics, we won't do it. The team is not strong enough, we won't do it. Now, last but not least, is is the business you're building in line with the direction of where humanity is heading from our perspective in terms of, of thesis? Now, we have three theses when it comes to marketplaces. Uh, we think that horizontal marketplaces, which are multi-category, are going to continue to verticalize. And so the it's not just Craigslist that's being verticalized, um, but it's also Upwork, 
Thumbtack, Uber Eats, you know, so we're seeing a company like TCG Player, it's the Magic the Gathering marketplace. Um, and you think, wait, well, that's super niche. Well, they're doing Magic the Gathering is $4 billion a year, and that company is already doing $150 million a year. There are many more opportunities that you think if you create a unique uh, bespoke experience. The second big trend is the transition of uh, the marketplaces for one where the buyer and the seller talk to each other. In fact, let me, I don't have these slides in this one, but I'll, I'll share them here um, to one where the marketplace picks the supplier for you. So uh, an example of that is in the old days, you go to Craigslist, you say, oh, I need um, uh, I need something and a billion people apply. You get Upwork because I need a programmer uh, and a million people apply. The new model is one where the marketplace picks the supplier for you. So you increase the user experience, you increase the conversion rate. So Comet picks the programmer for the that you want to hire. Rev picks the transcriber. Uber picks the driver. You're not selecting them on your behalf. And the third big trend for us right now is market is B2B marketplaces, where finally we're seeing the same trend in B2B of reinvention of the user experiences that we saw in the consumer world where we now have these extraordinary experiences on Airbnb, on Amazon, on Uber that are being brought. So now we have marketplaces for kind of everything, petrochemicals, that's Node, for hiring um, oil services workers, that's rig up, billions in GMV going through that. Uh, we were in Tread, a dump truck driver marketplace. So that's a $40 billion a year market. People don't think about this. And then in addition to that, overlaid with the three trends and theses we currently have when it comes to marketplaces, we have a bunch of other theses. Um, like it, we, we, have a, we have a specific perspective on the future of food where, for instance, I think in the future through increased, well, through dark kitchens plus increased density on delivery, um, and, and so increased density, automation, robotization, and perhaps autonomy and delivery, it's, you're going to be in a position to order extraordinarily high quality me meals for cheaper than you can make them yourselves. And, and it's going to be full transparency, organic, delivered to your place in 15 minutes. And in that world, I suspect 50% 50, 50 or more of all food will be, will be ordered online. And so we're still at the very beginning of the food ordering revolution. And that actually has a lot of implications in B2B and consumer and verticalization and cloud providers. Um, I have a perspective in the future of work uh, as well, that in the future, you will do the job you love to do and not the rest. So, and that has a lot of implications for the tech companies you build. So Slice, which is our vertical pizza food delivery company, actually crosses a lot of this. It's in the future of work because let's say you're Luigi, you're the owner of a pizzeria. What do you want to do? You want to cook pizzas. What do you not want to do? You don't want to be picking up the phone, creating a website, creating a mobile app, uh, uh, doing your accounting, creating packaging, answering comments in Yelp and TripAdvisor. So Slice goes to the Luigi's of the world and says, we will run all your back office. We'll pick up the phone. We'll create the website. We'll answer the questions. All you need to do is cook pizza and we'll take 10%, which has allowed them with basically no marketing to grow a business to six or seven hundred million in sales, it falls in the future of food in the sense it's a ver and ver it's a vertical, and and it uses B two B in a way it's B two B to C we're catering to the to the pizza areas and so it like crosses a lot of our different thesis and it's doing really well. So, you know, I presented a lot of content in very limited time and I'll pause there uh, and open it up for questions. Um, stop sharing uh, briefly, but basically, you know, it gives you a sense of our perspective on uh, base, how to fundraise, when to fundraise, from whom to fundraise, and what are people looking for, what do you need to demonstrate uh, to succeed in marketplaces, and then what are the current theses and trends in marketplaces in general. And yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> That, that was great. We got uh, quite a few comments um, as far as the, uh, the, the card marketplace. Um, so that, that was definitely interesting. Uh, hey, uh, Rich, did you want to come on? Because I know you uh, yeah. sent me a DM about that. Question. Sure. Hey, Fabrice, uh, founder of Unibo, which is a marketplace for office design and furnishing, similar to block renovation. That's how we're approaching it. I'm curious on yeah. your- Lo I love block renovation as a model, by the way. That's a vertical, think of it, it's a vertical thumbtack. It creates as a much higher user 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 experience. You don't need to, it, so yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and your thesis about vertical marketplaces is curious to me. Um, our competition is boutique interior design firms in every city in the US. 
Thumbtack that owns, you know, SEO and search. Uh, if we were to be very successful, we would have new entrants coming in, being very competitive with us if they have funding. So curious why you specifically like vertical marketplaces as opposed to going broader and horizontal. So first of all, if you can win the horizontal, that's usually a larger proposition, right? You'd rather be eBay than Reverb, right? Like all in all the category, Reverb is a music instrument marketplace doing about a billion in sales. You'd rather be Uber Eats than Slice. But often these broader horizontal categories are massively competitive. And, and once you have an incumbent that has powerful network effects, displacing them is really hard. But at the same time, these incumbents don't go vertical, they don't go transactional, they are not building B2B tools for the supply or like SaaS tools. One of the main success factor right now for our businesses is provide SaaS tools to one, free SaaS tools to one side of their, one side or the other of the marketplace to to lock them in and 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 provide a user experience that they would not get anywhere else now and so vertical usually has a it's easier to 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 win because you can curate the supply better if you know the category you can match the demand better with the supply etc uh that's it if you could be horizontal it's better to be horizontal and to be the winner in the horizontal but most of the core horizontal categories have been taken right you have a home advisor you have thumbtack competing with them head-on seems like a fool's proposition right now but actually verticalizing them in the right verticals right like um the right verticals meaning those where you can make the economics work so in your case you, you you're and and the, and the main economic issue for you is going to be the, the demand side by the way not the supply side where like do right. i think you can on a marketplace if you go to and that's true of 99 percent of marketplaces if you go to the supply and tell them hey i'm launching marketplace i have no clients but i don't charge you anything unless it's successful would you like to be there people are willing to be there uh, so 99 percent of marketplaces are demand constraints so the question is can you make the economics work on the demand acquisition I don't know the answer to that. It depends on, you need one of two things usually. You need a high average order value or recurrence or ideally both. Um, in your case, it's probably single transaction. So you need to make it work on a high on a high enough average order value then you make your economics work. And I want to see a three to one LTV to CAC uh, to demonstration. And by the way, the, the horizontals can very well be a, a, a distribution channel for you, right? Like, so in your case, you're not really competing necessarily with Thumbtack. They're just a lead gen for a billion other interior designers. If you are the very, the very best, essentially from their perspective, interior designer, even though you're in a marketplace model and transactional, they can send you customers, right? So they may be a distribution channel for you the same way that Carvana and Vroom uh, in the car marketplace space advertise on eBay or Auto Trader or whatever, or Craigslist. Yeah, and we, we do use them, so that's, that's great advice. Exactly. So you're not, you know, from that perspective, I'm not sure it's that competitive. Also, the type of tools you can do, that type of curation, your, your NPS should always be a lot higher. Yeah. Awesome. That's a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Levi, did you, did you want to come on? Oh, absolutely. Hey, Fabrice. Uh, you know, thanks for uh, carving out time for us to uh, ask questions like this. You know, I truly love um all the information you do, as well as your uh, weekly uh, sessions on Thursdays. Um, one of the questions I had, um, which is pertinent to how much responsibility a marketplace takes on. So in the instance of like Slice, right, when they take on customer service to answering the phones, like that's going to have an organizational debt to the organizations as it looks to scale, right? And with a 10% yep. take rate, um, you know, how do you as, as, you know, as sort of investors look at that because uh, I think, you know, very similarly for us, uh, as we're looking to take on sort of, you know, more responsibilities to sort of provide a holistic, uh, you know, view for the customer to, to really, you know, provide a kind of sure. like a, yeah. And, and so, yeah, we're just. We're so, just yeah, like, yeah. So you want a high NPS uh, and you want good economics, right? Like, so at the end of the day, the way I look at it is economics. In the, in the case yep. of Slice, the picking up the phone for them is, um, is part of their COGS. Right. So when, when you look at the unit economic slide, it would it, it would it would go, you know, here. Uh, whoops. Yeah. What are the cogs here? Like how much is it costing them to provide this relative to how much they're charging? Um, and they, they realize that their cost per order. So they, they built their call center in Macedonia. They found a bunch of English speakers there. The cost per order that they could transact 
was like peanuts. It was like like sub a dollar because they were paying people like three dollars an hour, four dollars an hour, uh, <laughs> uh, e- e- equivalent, and they were doing many calls per hour for orders. And so, as long as they had the economics working, it was okay. And now they thought through: Does it make sense to do this or not? And they realized that by doing this, they basically locked themselves in forever in the in the pizzeria. So churn on the pizzeria side is like zero. The the only churn they have is when the pizzerias go out of business or or the guy retires, doesn't want to keep doing the business anymore. And so for them, it became it, it worked. But obviously, I don't think you know managed marketplaces sometimes do too much to the point that they're no longer marketplaces. So in Rich's world, for instance, if if the people doing the design were were on staff rather than you know contractors on a marketplace model and, and they were that that would not be a marketplace anymore uh it'd just be a service provider it just it would be a service company just a traditional and true design company uh but if if those if he's curated the very best supply that he only pays when they do a job uh that then it's a marketplace and it just need to make sure that the economics work so the way i would look at it is what and, and and by the way, having doing customer care for people is in a way um, um, can be scalable. It's not, actually not all that hard. I mean, think of Uber. Uber runs customer care for the Uber drivers, right? Like the, you're not calling your Uber driver if you have an issue. You're calling Uber, and that's okay, right? Same thing with Uber Eats these days. You you call Uber Eats. You don't call the local restaurant. So, but you need to think through what are the leverage points? What where, What is the value that you're providing that's really unique? Uh, these days, it typically is more than just matching. It's not enough to usually say, oh, the two of you just meet and match, because that also often can lead to disintermediation. Whereas if they're using your tools, if you're providing ongoing value, if you have the rating and monitoring, et cetera, if there's other stuff there, your ability to take a rake increases dramatically. Thanks, Fabrice. Awesome. That was great. Cool. So we got, uh, hey, Jake, do you uh, want to come on? Sure. Um, thank you, Fabrice. Super helpful here. Um, so I'm Jake McIntyre, founder of Wine Key Virtual Wine and in-person uh, tastings and experiences. Um, so what would you find favorable in terms of an average order value to frequency of transaction ratio? <laughs> Look, the in a way, it doesn't matter. What matters more is what's your CAC, right? And what do you need to cover your CAC? Um, so I don't know who you're competing for on a, on a keyword basis. Uh, the, you know, the, you know, like a company like Uber, their AOV is like probably, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks. But people are using it at this. And, and they have massive negative churn because people the first year are using them like two times a month. Year two, they're using it four times a month. Year five, they're using them. 18 times a month. So even if they've lost 30% of their customers to someone else, their LTV is, you know, insanely high. Um, in general, I find it easier to make the economics work with recurrence rather than a high AOV. All the all the high AOV companies have, have not done rather very well, except for maybe in the car space and the real estate space, um, like the mattress companies. Uh, the for a variety of reasons, a it's a, I mean, a it's a single transaction. B the AOV is not that high ultimately, um, and 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 also people just competed the margin to zero. Um, so marketplaces, by the way, that I like the best are the ones that not are not or not competing on price. I like marketplaces that are competing on user experience, NPS, quality of the transaction. Like you do the at the same price as the offline options, you're doing it a million times better. Uh, if you're competing on price, at some point, someone will always undercut you. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Hey, Fabrice, um, do you have a, just kind of given some of the, maybe some of the questions that we're asking, do you have an example of a recent investment um, that's a little bit earlier stage that you could share and uh, maybe just kind of speak to, to why you like it? Um. They think through. Uh, da, 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 da. Maybe I should look at what companies we invested in this week. Uh, it'll be easy. One second. Uh, we invested in six companies this week, so yeah. there might be one that I actually took a call with. Do, 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 do. Let's see what we invested in this week. But you know, look, we we let me give you an example. A year ago. I, we did a seed round in uh, Chow Bus, which is a Chinese food uh, delivery company. Mm-hmm. Um, they had, and they were doing like 700K a month in GMV. 
<laughs> and no one wanted to invest in it. And no one wanted to invest in it because all the VCs were like, wait a minute, I can order Chinese food on Seamless Grubhub or Uber Eats. Why do I need this? And what they had realized is that the multiple things, A, the Chinese food uh, restaurant owners were Chinese, didn't really speak English particularly well. And so they provided them with back office tools, both in Mandarin and in English. And then they realized that Chinese immigrants in the US were ordering Chinese food six times a week and, and or using WeChat. Many of the Chinese were in WeChat. So they started spamming WeChat uh, and they had a scalable CAC, they had a CAC of zero essentially. And people were ordering over and over and over and over again. And so we saw the dynamics. We're like, okay, this is amazing. We can help you. So we, even though they're doing 700K a month, I think we invested like eight pre or something ridiculous. Um, and then COVID hit and food delivery exploded. And they did 5 million a month in this February from up from 700K. And then I think now they're up 20 million a month or something completely ridiculous. And they just raised now to 300 million valuation. So VCs actually eventually caught on and, and agreed with us. Um, another company I love is a company uh, called Freshia. We invested in them at the very beginning where they're like, you know what? There's MindBody, which is kind of this open table for hair salons, et cetera. The thing is, they're very old. They're, they sell you a tool. And, and the salon, the, the spas and the, the barbershops, they hate paying them because they're paying them $5, five dollars a reservation for their own existing customers. And so what Schedule did is they said, you know what? We're going to offer this for free forever. Uh, we're never going to monetize your own customers. Um, we were providing the exact same tool and they signed up in frankly record time through 30 and now they're at 40,000 barber shops and salons and spas and they started having 4 billion of GMB going through the platform within like a year I mean not monetizing at all but once they had 4 billion of GMV per year going through the platform like 350 million a month they started going to Stripe and and PayPal and Adian and all the payment companies and saying hey give me the best deal you've ever had and so then they they negotiated they got whatever they were charged two percent instead three percent then they went to the barber shops and they said we'll we'll take over a pos and we'll we'll charge you 2.6 which is cheaper you can get on your own and now they have this spread and now they're doing hundreds of thousands of revenues and now raising hundreds of millions right we did that deal maybe a year or two ago uh more recent deal we did um nancy anything comes to mind that we did recently that was interesting well, I, I go in Jeff's weekly to-dos and think through the companies. I was just about to do that. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Let me see what companies we invested in recently. Let me see, look at the debriefs I took, because usually when I take a call, I invest. <laughs> um, let me look at my recent. Uh, oh, yeah, I love that one, but that's an A. Let me give you a seed. Uh, can I see Domi? Oh yeah, that's a that's a cool one. Um, it's a French marketplace. Well, I, yeah, maybe that's too late stage as well. Wait, let me go earlier stage for you. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, this one is really early, actually. Uh, it's a pre-seed round, essentially. It's a company called Showcase. They created a. Um, they they they. It's a new way for brands to to get consumer feedback, and, and so they create this package or this box. So they, they they have people sign up, and all and people sign up to get a free box. And in return to that, they're going to evaluate um, they're going to evaluate the packages on the back end that they receive. And so you get full demographic information. So now you're whatever you're Coke, and you want to taste a new drink. You send the drink to the showcase, and then the part of a package of like five four or five products they send to people per month, that that will that drink will be in there and they get consumer feedback. So it's replacing, it's a company that is replacing um, um, focus groups at, at a much, much cheaper way. And CAC has been zero on the user side because when you go to people and you tell them, hey, we'll send you stuff to try for free every month, you want it, that's great. Uh, and a lot of the CPG companies have been signing up. So here they signed up a sales team. Their CAC was also really low because these sales, the sales team, the, the companies have been on average sending one of these all the time. The economics are insane. So the, the way it works is they're charging $60 for completed survey. 
and they have a 90 percent um uh com completion rate and on average they have enough people that they're making like at a, a 900 uh per per survey with the with the ones they are people are loving it they're doing seven items per box and they're charging that a whole bunch of different brands so you know basically with like no money and, and they built this completely bootstrapped uh having tested another model that i hated i told them to drop they they try to do uh vending machines where people took a test products and get feedback and i didn't like that because the you need to pay for the vending machines. You need to refill them, uh, and you weren't locking in the 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 the, the rating the reviews on it. But once they pivoted uh, and they started doing that, so now they're pre-seed. They're still pretty low in revenues. I think they're like fifteen or twenty k a month. But that revenue is all margin. Their 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 transaction costs. Uh, per box are very low, and they're actually charging that through, and then then they charge the sixty dollars per survey, uh, which which is a lot, which is pure margin. That's a ninety five percent gross margin product. So, so the key there is, can they scale the um, the demand side? Meaning, can they scale getting more CPG companies to try them? And, and but it's so much cheaper and better than the alternative, and their NPS is so high that I think the answer is yes. Even though they didn't yet have like a, a good sense of like, okay, what is my sales? person going to cost me how much deals can they close me and how much retention recurrence they had so that's why for us it, it's a pre-seed check it's a flyer because a lot of these things are not proven but the valuation is reflective of that we invested they were raising one at four pre and we put in 220k in that round where there's no real lead because it's a pre-seed round right so often the pre-seed rounds there's no lead it's a bunch of angels it could be like 20 angels putting 50k or whatever the lead only started happening in the seed round uh, and so there, the fact that the team was extraordinary, they'd both come from that world before, they'd worked in in big, in, in, in those companies, they they just came out of Warden Business School, they were amazing, amazing storytellers, really knew what they were doing, were, were super compelling. And so here we weighted that more. Awesome. That was a great example. Thanks for uh, sharing more on that. So sounds yeah. like sounds like we need to uh, have them part of the group here. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Hey, uh, Mossy, do you want to come on? Because I know you... Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, Fabrice, fellow uh, kite surfer here as well. Um, so I'm. My name is uh, Massimiliano. I'm the founder of um, Bombinate.com, where I manage marketplace for um, conscious, sustainable menswear and furniture. Um, so we curate brands um, yep. that produce uh, ethically, um, um, and we've been live for approximately two years now. I wanted to ask you, according to your experience uh, with marketplace, what is what are the typical mistakes that uh, marketplaces uh, tend to do with their org charts um, post seed uh, into Series A? What uh, what's something that uh, you advise your portfolio companies uh, to always do, to always watch out for, to to really uh, be careful of? Yeah, I, I mean, don't overhire early, right? Like, I only hire when it starts to hurt, when I really need that position. Um, the I don't expect you after your seed round to have everything in place. You know, your CFO, your <laughs> your CMO, your like the entire team. Um, and and it usually, I mean, it depends on the co-founders you have, but usually your co-founding team and you can go rather far. Um, the so that, that, that that's one clear message look the rest is very basic like you know i'd never hire for the sake of expediency like if it's hurting really badly and you're like ah this guy's kind of good he's gonna help let's hire him that's always a mistake like get the very best person you can get and if it takes a month extra and you suffer and you, you have more sleepless nights and and working, working weekends for for a month an extra month that's totally fine like get the very best person don't never compromise on hiring um and then the rest is easy everybody e not easy but like obvious like fire fast like someone is not working you're usually not going to be working so you never regret letting go of someone early enough when you have a doubt doubts about them um but yeah no i i'd be just don't be careful in your burn right like if you're raising three million seed this needs to get you to your a and I expect you to triple in size. Most of that money is going to go to your marketing team, right? Like, so uh, to spending on, on, well, marketing, meaning customer acquisition, whatever channel that is. I don't know. I, wouldn't, I would not get the burn higher than 150K a month, for instance, uh, because that gives you kind of like 18 months plus your buffer um, if you have 3 million. Now, if you, if you just raise a million seed rounds, 
you know, your burn probably should be like 50K, right? Like most people are still going to be, you're, you're still going to be aiming for ramen profitability. And like, you know, like people are barely paying themselves on the founder side uh, and keeping things under control because the last thing you want to do is run out of money before you've gotten in enough traction to be able to convince people to do your next round. So the, the, the goal of your pre seed round is to get your seed round because you're not getting a profitability. Your goal of your seed round is to get your A round. Your goal of your A round is to get your B round. After that, you can choose profitability, scalability, et cetera. But as a result, in those 18 months, you don't want to blow the money stupidly because that you need to get to where you need to be for the next round. And by the way, most people don't make it, right? Like the of the every year in the US, about 5,000 companies raise uh, over 500K in seed or pre seed, let's say. Uh, of these, only 25% are going to get the next round, and only 60% are going to get the next round, and only 40% are going to get the next round. So the five-year survival rate of a startup is about 7%. Um, and so most people don't make it. Perfect. Thanks, Aris. Awesome. Cool. By the way, the one mistake I'd avoid making when you're building a marketplace is not related to hiring, is don't put too much supply, especially labor marketplaces. Like it's very easy. I'm launching a locksmith marketplace to get every locksmith in New York to go in the marketplace because they're going to, if you tell them, Hey, I, I might have customers for you. The thing is you're going to have so little demand for them that most of them are not going to be engaged. They're going to churn. They're going to even forget. They're not going to reply. So instead you get one, you get the very best for whatever is zip code. Then you find demand for him. Ideally you want to represent 25% of his revenues at least, then he's going to be engaged. He's going to be happy. He's going to be replying and responsive. And if not, you kick him out, put another one, and then you scale. And so always match supply and demand. You start supply, then you get him demand. A good metrics are if you're selling products, 25% of the products placed on sale uh, should sell. Um, if you're for, for used goods, uh, for new goods, it's a little bit different. Uh, if you're, and, 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 and that's on the low end. I mean, that's, that means you have liquidity. So if you're eBay or reverb or, or Etsy, et cetera, but for them, it's as high as 60% of the products placed on sales sell, but, um, 25% is what the met, lower end metric you should be shooting for. If you're a service marketplace, you should be representing like 25% of the revenues. I, I mean, look, in the long run, you be you want to be representing 100% of the revenues of your supply. But in the short run, if you could be meaningful and significant enough for them, and usually that's around 25%, that they that they will be active and checking you, et cetera, that'll be, that's amazing. So curate your supply, then find them demand, then scale it up like that in parallel always. Because it's very easy to get infinite supply. You bring them no customers. They're not engaged. They churn. They hate the experience. When, then when the consumers come, they apply – they don't know how to pick first of all, it's too much choice. And then even if you pick for them, the people that you pick may not reply, may not be engaged. That's a great point. Um, cool. Hey, Levi, did you want to come on? You said that's a perfect time for you to come in for the question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think that this exactly hits on a point that I'd love for you to just kind of dig deeper, especially uh, for us at the pre-seed going to the you know seed stage, uh, this idea of like you know minimum viable happiness or liquidity, and so you talk about like if you list the product on there, then um, you want to then represent twenty five percent of the ink like to 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 represent twenty five percent of the income stream for that one product. So is that a, a well? No, 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 no. If you're selling if you're selling a product, well, let's say it's a used good and it's unique. Um, and make it be, and I'll explain the non-unique case in a second. Like, if it's a used good and it's unique, the thing is, uh, the the reason these marketplaces end up being monopolies essentially is if you listen to five sites and it sells to five sites, you're screwed because you only have one site of product to sell. And so very rapidly, people migrate to selling it only in one place. And so you know what you want to have is if I'm if I'm reverb, I'm selling music instruments. You want a 25% probability that the item sells within a, a, the defined time period. So that's what you're shooting for. Um, now, if if the if it's a new good or if it's well, if or if it's a service, so you're selling a person, then you want to represent 25% of their time and income uh, because then they're 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 you're meaningful to them to the point that they're not going to go else work elsewhere. You know, so, and if you are selling new goods, then you want to be a 
one of the larger distribution channels for that supplier uh, rel relative to other chip places where they could sell. Because that's when you guarantee that they're locked in. Now, in this case, it may not be 25% because many people can sell you know, the same product on Shopify and Amazon and whatever. But uh, so new goods, it's a little bit, non-unique goods is trickier. Unique goods, 25% is the right metric for sure. Got it. Cool. All right, so I think uh, we have time for one last question here. Um, so, hey, Suzanne, did you uh, want to come on? Yeah, please. Hi, um, I was speaking to Arn um, earlier in the year, so I'm very familiar. Okay. But aside from money, what other what other value would you be looking for when a when a founder goes to a to a VC? The it depends what you need. Um, I'll tell you what the value we choose to provide. So it, it, it also depends on the stage, right? Like, so if you're at the Series B and you're talking to uh, Andreessen or Firstmark, they have multi-billionaire funds. And as a result of having multi-billionaire funds, their fee structure is such that they have a lot of money to hire venture partners. So at Firstmark, at Greylock, at first, a, a, a Andreessen will have headhunters on staff they can help you recruit they're going to have uh, and people in their network that can that can help you do bd deals whatever that is not what a pre-seed or seed stage fund can do because currently the fee structure i have on on the on the money i have under management doesn't even pay the current fee costs of the of the fund so what we do is three very specific things um a and perhaps most importantly we will help you fundraise so because we don't lead rounds we don't price rounds we we share deals with all the major VCs in the world. And so if, if we invest with you at a pre-seed, we'll help you get your seed round. If we invest with you at seed, we'll help you get your, your A and your B, et cetera. And just as importantly, if we love you, but you don't have a lead yet, we'll help you find a lead for your current round. So help you fundraise is, I think, primary thing we do. Uh, and I think you should expect from them. Two is it's good to have people that know the business you're in. And, and that's why if you're a marketplace, I would go to marketplace investors. There's a bunch of them. We are part of that. Like you're going to have a much more intelligent conversation and also our ability to help you on, you know, should you, should, should your take rate be 1%, 5%, 50%, you know, we've seen it so many times we can help you. We can even help you design the test to do it. Um, and so we can help you think through, you know, customer acquisition channels, et cetera. So market, so have ideally have someone who has specificity and, 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 and knowledge in your category, um, though that one becomes less relevant with time. You know, once you're at the C, once you already have product market fed, you know, economics at work, my, my, you don't need me to help you. You don't need me to figure it out. At pre seed, you need me more. At, at A, you need me less already because things are already working out. Uh, but just work with people that you like, frankly. Like it's kind of marriage, right? You're going to be with them for a long time. So especially the lead guys, we're not lead. We're passive. We're not passive. We will we'll, we will provide the help you want. Meaning, if you ask us for help, we'll provide it. But we are not going to be hunting you to help you. So you, it's it's the onus is on you. Uh, and the third thing we do is we help you once you get to scale and you have the right channel with TV advertising because we build attribution models and we found that in a number of markets, you can actually um, have lower CAC on TV than online. But obviously, in the portfolio, we have 600 companies. The ones that really need it is like sub 20. Nonetheless, for the ones that need it, the value we provide is great. But the main thing we do is fundraising. And then it depends, right? As I said, if you're at A or B, get get people that you like to, that you like to work with. You think they're going to have your back when things go badly. They're going to be there for you when things go well. And they're going to be thoughtful. You love working with them. And then they know the business you're in, ideally. And, and yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. That's a, that a great question to uh, wrap it up on because I was actually just going to ask if you could share a little <laughs> bit more. Um, so, hey, uh, Fabrice, is there anything uh, that you would like to kind of leave us with? Um, just kind of... Um, not particularly, but I look. I, I I write a lot and and speak a lot about these topics. Uh, mm -hmm. You can just follow my blog at febrisgrinder.com. I have a whole, like our investment philosophy, or strategy, how we get deal flow. My next three blog posts that are not related to my live streaming show are how FG Labs evaluates startups. So everything we presented today, I'm going to actually write it up in a blog post. Uh, what are current investment theses? I, I presented that in my last show, but I'm going to actually write it up in. And how our venture studio pro pro program works. So a lot of these things we cover, but I cover 
a lot of things, you know, like this week, tomorrow, Nancy is discussing, you know, as first time founders, should you be an accelerator versus a studio versus do it yourself? Uh, next week, the week after, we're, so there's a whole bunch of ongoing content that I keep creating on this. So uh, you're welcome to follow it and ask questions publicly and I'll reply typically. Awesome. I'll definitely uh, share it in the group. So yeah, thanks again for uh, taking time to join us and, uh, and answer some of the questions that we had. So definitely we all appreciate it. So. No worries. Bye guys. Bye.